You mentioned in your opening remarks there that you're talking about making changes to better align the immigration system with our employment needs, you know, construction, um, healthcare, things like that. Are you proposing here then uh, changes to the point system as it operates? Because I know the previous minister made some changes to that. I'm just wondering if you're proposing to go further than that. Yeah, it, it's a well, good question. I'm looking at about six or seven options that uh, that we're working with uh, my my department on putting forward with people. Uh, it, it it needs to be socialized and, and, and work with different industry players uh, to look at what kind of buy-in they would get. But um, a number of options. One would be increasing the points. I mean, that is sort of the area where we have mo we have, we've met hope and demand because uh, giving someone points for 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 the qualifications that they have does not necessarily guarantee they will get the job within the industry that that they want to be in. Uh, that's the challenge of the Federation with jurisdictions that are large, largely responsible um, when it comes to professions and regularizing professions, professions that the Supreme Court has said lies with provinces and territories. Um, so not just that, because I think it's important. It's important to have the skill set. Uh, it's also important to have people and organizations that will train up people that come into this country uh, and get them up to this, the, the level of, uh, of expertise that they need to, in this case, build houses, whether it's industrial or, 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 or residential, two different types of, uh, of demands in that area. Looking at the industry codes that we are actually looking for in a more scientific way, whether it's roofers um, or welders, that is an important consideration that gets into le different levels of granularity, but it goes to the efforts that we're trying to make to really align the skill set with the needs that are there. There's a huge aging out in the construction industry that people are really scared about, and I think that is uh, a looming a looming challenge. Um, if we just don't have the people, we will not be able to build the houses that, that people want to build. Um, there's also options that we're looking for because we don't want to continue to be too addicted on temporary foreign work to make sure there is a pathway to permanent residence for those people that come here and help build the country. Um, and whether that goes through uh, a, a mechanic of using, being able to leverage people that are in this country that have fallen out of status or have an irregular status in this country, that's also an, a couple of options that I'm sort of freewheeling in front of you with a ton of cameras on me, but it is an internal policy process. But we want to look uh, and work with unions, uh, labor, industry, to make sure that we're actually responding in a nimble way to their needs. And, and I would put in this the, the role of the provinces, too, that have been working to, to, to work on that foreign credential recognition, which is a huge part of this puzzle that remains um, only partially solved. And then you mentioned um, aligning international student uh, numbers better with, I think you said, demand. Um, what does that look like? And is that demand from the institutions? Because we've seen they've increased it threefold over the last decade, so they certainly see the demand. Or is that demand from industry in terms of having those international students work in Canada? Yeah, I mean, look, there is a lot of conversations with different competing policy priorities. You have uh, industries in low-skilled labor. Um, whether it's big box shops or others looking for uh, cheap labor and, and wanting to make sure that they maintain a 40-hour work week for some of the students. That's the competing policy with the labor gap that, we've, that, that, we've, that we face in this country, and we need those people working, and why not if they're paying a whole heck of a lot of money to, 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 to come to Canada to study more than a domestic student? Uh, why would we deny them that right? So uh, some competing issues there that we need to really tackle with knowing that the notion of having international students is not necessarily and does not guarantee a pathway to permanent residency and citizenship, but in the context of, um, of, of, of labor demands that are really leaning heavily on these people and sometimes in really skilled areas like, like healthcare, construction. Some of the people I saw at Sheridan College this weekend uh, are people that will want their postgraduate work permits more better aligned to the needs of industry. The postgraduate work permit program is not something that's been re reviewed really in a decade. Um, it's why I was cautious in my, in my announcement, because the work is ongoing, but making sure we're aligning uh, the ability of someone to live and study in this country um, to the needs of the, sec uh, of, of, of the employment industry in Canada is, is something that needs some reform and, 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 a, and a closer look at, obviously juggling sometimes competing policy needs. Um, that's over and above the discussions on the integrity of the system and fraud that we were tackling first and foremost, and then the role of the provinces to to, to kind of sh um, fix the, a problem that has been nothing but growing in the last few years. Uh, Minister Miller, Teria's Re Global News. You've said that Canada is not planning on dropping immigration levels, but you know, given the housing crunch, given pressures on the healthcare system, how confident are you that Canada will be able to absorb 
a, a record number of new covers at this pace. Yeah, and, and again, it's something that we need to be very, very careful and mindful of, particularly in the, in the, in the public discourse that we entertain. We often look on the supply side, not the demand side, of what is, is achieved here. I think speaking of these immigration levels in, in economic terms is crucial to its acceptability by Canadians. Um, you know, the healthcare industry, uh, nurses, uh, dentists, pharmacists, have a huge proportion of immigrants or, or newly arrived Canadians associated with them. And if we are going to, in the context of an aging, po aging population, be able to give Canadians the services that they're entitled to and have expected Canada to and are the signature of, uh, of who we are as Canadians and free and open healthcare system, uh, we need immigration. Um, not looking on immigrants as a drain on the system is, 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 is a key sort of more than real, but it's also psychological. Um, be important for, for, for continuing to create social consensus around, around immigration. So too in the construction field. I think by proportion, um, as I understand it, immigration are, is, 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 fewer immigrants are actually in the construction area and trades uh, for a number of reasons, including some over-regulation, but um, not matching what I mentioned before, supply and demand properly. And that's why we're looking at a number of policies to do that better, because we know with that industry, which will go through a critical moment as people age out, um, we just need those those folks. People can be trained domestically, but also trained up. And we're seeing that in, in international student situations where people are in the trades. Um, but it's something that 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 uh, we'll have to continue to monitor because people are, have a tendency to look at the pure, you know, five hundred thousand, for example, as volume of people that suddenly overnight came into Canada. Thirty-five percent of the people are already here. Um, it's just largely misunderstood and. A good chunk of that, an even larger chunk of that, are people that will uh, actually help build those houses and create the capital, invest the capital into uh, in, in, into continuing to build our country. Um, on the social consensus part of it, we know that there's broad public support for immigration in Canada. But how worried are you that that support may wane if you don't get this right and people don't have a place to live when they get here? Yeah, I mean, I think the the throughout the last couple months in particular, uh, the real issue is getting our acts together. And, and I think that's f foremost for the people to come here. Um, I think people, in, unless, look, people flying, f fleeing, fleeing war and famine is a very, very small war, uh, or, or the effects of climate change, sub-Saharan Africa, others find their way to Canada. Um, they're fleeing some very difficult situations. Hard for me to judge them. Uh, the vast majority of the others don't necessarily expect the government of Canada to provide them a house on arrival. It's a very important working premise. Uh, at the same time, I, it, it, this is again an issue of failure of planning in, in terms of the, the housing crunch, something that's been uh, that's been in the mix for for three to four decades. As a result of the failures of, of, of previous uh, conservative and liberal governments federally to address this issue, and, 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 and provinces as well. Provinces have a huge role in this, and um, as we talk this is the, sort of the, 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 the subtle genius of the housing accelerator is you're not lecturing cities and towns, you're actually creating incentives for, for people to buy in. So you're not automatically getting into a fight with the jurisdiction. You're actually creating the incentives to, for people to start building and stuff, for people to start densify. If you look at other similarly situated countries, we were rel well, just look at the size, but even within cities, we were relatively not dense. This is something that we can work on and it's something that, that uh, my colleague and my predecessor, Sean Fraser, has been, has been focused on. Again, we can't do it alone. Um, which is why we need everyone on board, as I said. Oui, bonjour, Monsieur Medeu, Pascal Vachon pour TFO. Je me demandais, est-ce que vous sentez une pression à plafonner ou à maintenir euh, les niveaux en immigration euh, après vos discussions avec les provinces, avec les, les gens dans le milieu? Est-ce que vous sentez une pression? Moi, honnêtement, ça dépend. Je pense que si, toutes les provinces, territoires ont leurs propres demandes, leurs propres demandes à l'intérieur des, des rubriques. Euh, que ça soit plus d'autonomie, que ça soit plus euh, de, de gens dans telle, telle ou telle industrie. Je n'ai pas fait l'exercice, mais j'ose croire que si je mettais toutes les demandes ensemble, on serait bien au-delà de 400, 500 000 euh, de gens qui se trouvent généralement dans, dans, dans les visées de, de, de nos plans. Euh, C'est important pour le gouvernement fédéral d'avoir un rôle d'organisation. C'est notre juridiction. Euh, mais aussi pouvoir cibler, guider la conversation sur l'accessibilité sociale des immigrants, euh, l'importance d'arrimer l'offre et, 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 la, et la demande. Euh, 
mais c'est clair qu'on voit, on voit, des, on voit des pressions dans, dans, dans toute situation où il, y a, euh, où il y a des crises ou des défis, surtout dans la crise au logement, puis il y a cette tendance de regarder le volume, puis malheureusement de l'associer au... Euh, à la, à la réponse facile ou à une solution facile, c'est-à-dire l'immigration. Le défi, c'est de, de décortiquer tous les différents canaux, les façons dont les gens viennent pour contribuer à notre pays, et de se dire, bon, ouais, voilà, ce sont des gens qui contribuent de façon nette à l'accroissement du, du PIB, euh, à, à, à souvenir les demandes dans les, pour la, dans, dans, les, dans les pénuries nuancées de main dœuvre à travers le pays. Euh, si je sens la pression, il y a toujours une pression dans ce que je fais. Euh, mais c'est clair que cette discussion est, est, est plus à l'avant-plan qu'elle l'était il y a deux ans, je ne vais pas le dire. Dans cette question sur l'immigration francophone, euh, il y a plusieurs organismes francophones qui vous demandent une cible de 10-12 Est-ce que vous ne vous sentez pas que si vous parlez de 6 notamment, vous ne vous sentez pas que vous contribueriez au deadline du français au Canada, au deadline du poids démographique des francophones, si vous allez en bas de 12 Bien, tant et aussi longtemps qu'on ne l'aura pas rétabli, euh, je ne vais pas être satisfait du résultat. Pour moi, comme je l'ai dit à votre collègue, c'est d'avoir quelque chose qui est réaliste ré et réalisable. Euh, puis je ne veux, veux pas tomber dans le cynisme et faire une annonce euh, qui, qui ne serait pas réalisable sans avoir les, les mécanismes en place pour, de, pouvoir, de pouvoir répondre aux défis, un défi très important. Alors, c'est la raison pour laquelle vous allez voir les niveaux qui sont fixés euh, dans, 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 dans les quelques jours à suivre. Euh, mais moi, mon défi au courant de la prochaine année, c'est vraiment de travailler avec mon département pour s'assurer qu'on a les mécanismes en place pour favoriser non seulement euh, l'augmentation du volume, c'est-à-dire l'augmentation du numérateur, mais aussi euh, de l'intégration qui n'est pas un, un, qui, 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 qui est un défi de taille. Hein. Vous n'allez pas demander à, à un couple euh, parfait francophone du Vietnam ou du Cameroun ou de la Belgique de, du jour au lendemain d'être le porte-étendard euh, du fait français du Québec. Ce, ce, ce serait présomptueux. Mais je suis sûr qu'ils le feront s'ils se trouvent accompagnés, puis dans une communauté où ils se sentent bien, ils ont accès à l'école euh, et des ressources. Alors ça, c'est un défi d'intégration qui nous incombe, mais qui, qui relève aussi des provinces. Um, you said that housing affordability would be a key factor when you're talking about uh, working out the levels of immigration, um, but clearly uh, they differ across Canada. I mean, the price of a flat in Saskatoon is very different from one in Toronto. Are you envisaging, uh, um, you know, linking immigration to location, uh, or, or are you talking about broader uh, restrictions based on how to, housing affordability? If you could just expand on that, that would be very helpful. Yeah, and I don't, I, I don't think the thinking is, is uh, you, you know, I, don't, I don't think simply we don't have the tools to be able to implement, uh, or, nor would it be necessarily be des desirable, um, particularly when you're only looking at one side of the equation, when you just look at the raw supply and say this is a supply of people coming to Canada. They themselves have capital, they're driving up the prices. That isn't the reason why interest rates have been hiked over the last few years. Um, and it isn't the reason we are seeing certain spikes in, in, in certain, um, in certain regions of Canada. Uh, again, what we are really trying to compose with is a, skills, a skill shortage, knowing that that skill shortage uh, has not necessarily been properly um, rectified or addressed by the federal government or provincial governments for that matter. Um, I know my own home, prom home province, we went into the pandemic with, uh, with a labor shortage and we came out with a labor shortage and we haven't properly addressed it, um, particularly given the particularities of the relationship we have with Quebec. I, I would say also, and when we talk about affordability, we also have to, and, and planning, we also have to have the ability, particularly in rural regions, uh, to accommodate people that are coming there to fill important gaps, whether it's you know, maintaining a hospital that was on the verge of closing, or a school, those people need somewhere to stay. So that challenge is not insignificant, and it will vary from region to region. I think the strategic plan, and, and even if we have the best plan, Plenty of governments would not necessarily follow it, but it is something that is important as a guide for us to look at where the challenges are and to make sure we're reflecting on it. So um, I don't want to confuse correlation with causation, and I don't want to pretend that this is a linear, this is a linear discussion, but it's certainly something we need to be sensitive to, particularly given the volumes that have, um, that have, that have generated, at least in the aggregate, 
these discussions that we're seeing that are more um, more in the public eye in the last year or so. Um, on a different topic, I wonder if you could comment on uh, your thoughts about the plight of Palestinians. I know there are many trapped in Gaza with family here who are desperate to get them here. I know it's difficult, obviously it's closed off at the moment, but there has been talk in Parliament about uh, whether Canada should create a scheme as, as we did for the Ukrainians, and I wondered if that's something that is on the horizon or something that's being discussed. And equally in Lebanon, I gather the people who uh, have family here, and uh, of course the Canadian government has said advise them to leave, but there are long queues to get visas if uh, you know the, the accounts of some families can be uh, uh, credited. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts about that. I have a lot. Uh, I think that what's going on in Gaza is, is a humanitarian calamity. Um, our focus primarily as a government is getting out Canadians and their families from Gaza. There's um, a shade over 400 there that, that are trapped. But that needs to be and remain our primary focus. Um, we are planning for all eventualities and planning foremost to make sure that there isn't an escalation of the conflict. But we are planning particularly even the volumes of Canadians and family members that live in Lebanon to make sure that uh, were something to arise that we are properly prepared um, to respond quickly. Uh, obviously there has been no triggering event as of yet, but it's something that we are working on um, really hard. As to the theoretical, uh, I don't want to entertain the theoretical of what happens if um, we are trying to prevent the if, and I think that is, that is and will remain the focus for now. But obviously very conscious of uh, what's been um, what's been spoken about in, in terms of potential resettlement but again um, I can't comment on it publicly at this time hi minister yesterday your department sent emails to the would-be Afghan migrants who still have applications pending and are waiting in Pakistan the note told them to not leave their guest houses because of concerns Pakistan would arrest or deport them. It also told them to actually email your department if they do get arrested. And also noted that your department can't help them regularize their stay in Pakistan even if their application process to Canada is completed. Do you expect uh, a migrant in a jail cell to be able to email your department? And what hope is there for these folks at this point given you've reached your goal of 40,000? So I do not presume that a migrant in a jail cell will um, receive any form of communication. Uh, I am very concerned about particularly our, particularly our clients that we make commitments to in Afghanistan, um, often living in, in, in really, really difficult conditions with fear hanging over their head. I briefly had the chance to speak to the interim um, government's Pakistani, Pakistan's Minister of the Interior uh, very briefly on Sunday to express my concerns about uh, the potential removal of Afghans into, into Afghanistan and my concern at that level. Uh, obviously, in order for this to work and to get people to safety in Canada, uh, it takes a working relationship. So uh, it was a productive conversation. Um, I am also very conscious of my role to be very careful in not lecturing people about their interior and domestic politics. Um, and it's something that, that, for the sake of those that we are trying to serve and get out of Afghanistan, will be very judicious publicly in speaking about Graffi. Uh, that said, it was, a, it was a very productive conversation and it's work that will be ongoing. I have said, it, I have said uh, time and time again that the 40,000 number is not uh, a ceiling in and of itself uh, because we do have to look at what our commitment was to, to Afghans and those who served us when we made it a couple of years ago, and to make sure we fulfill that to the best of our ability, knowing that we are working in a very difficult operational environment, difficult in Pakistan, um, difficult in other partner countries, but even most difficult inside Afghanistan. Thanks, and just on another note, um, Israel's Ministry of Intelligence presented their government with a concept paper that suggested Palestinians could be moved out of Gaza and that um, Canada itself uh, could accept them as refugees. What do you say to that idea? Uh, hard to speculate on it. Um, we are uh, open to those 
fleeing war, this is a war. Uh, at the same time, it's something that it's very difficult for me to speculate publicly on. I haven't read the report, would have to read it. Uh, but again, the focus, as I mentioned to your colleague, is to get a humanitarian corridor open to welcome Canadians and their families out of Gaza. It is still very much a pressing concern and one that um, remains unfulfilled. Yet. Bonjour, Monsieur le ministre. Antoine Trevanier du journal Le Droit. Le Conference Board puis euh, l'Institut sur la citoyenneté a annoncé ce matin les chiffres concernant les immigrants euh, qui partaient du Canada une, après être arrivés au pays. Euh, depuis les années 80, ces chiffres-là montent constamment. En 2019, on parle de 67 000 immigrants qui ont décidé de partir. Comment vous réagissez à ces chiffres-là, à ce rapport-là? Puis comment votre plan d'aujourd'hui peut répondre à ça finalement? Mais sans savoir les raisons particulières pour lesquelles les gens choisissent de quitter le pays, euh, difficile de vous donner des, des, des réponses de, concrètes. C'est clair que si on peut en découler un, une thématique, oui, peut-être le, le, le coût d'y vivre, de vivre au Canada, euh, et, et, et difficile, difficile, difficulté d'intégration. Les gens aussi, quand c'est des, quand des, gens, des, des, des migrants de type dit économique, ils ont leur choix de pays aussi. Hein, donc, euh, D'une certaine façon, on veut ces gens-là, on veut qu'ils s'intègrent parce qu'ils apportent, apportent du capital au pays. Ce ne sont pas nécessairement des gens qui sont désespérés. Il y a un certain désespoir qui pousse les gens à venir euh, au Canada. Je ne leur enlève rien. Mais la large majorité des gens qui viennent ici, c'est des gens qui viennent pour des raisons économiques. Donc, c'est-à-dire, c'est des gens qui ont du capital, qui ont du choix. Euh, avec les chiffres qui augmentent, il faudrait garder le, le, le pourcentage pour voir s'il y a vraiment une tendance. Ce que moi, je vois de mon bord, c'est des demandes de, sans précédent de venir au Canada euh, dans les 5 millions de, 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 de dossiers qui, qui ont été traités euh, ici cette année. C'est un volume absolument record. Alors, euh, pour que je puisse en parler en détail, il va falloir que, que je regarde ça. Mais on, on, on suit ça, là, parce que ce qu'on ne veut pas, c'est des inefficacités qui font en sorte que les gens choisissent un autre pays. On vient juste de lancer des initiatives qui sont ici sur mesure pour des gens qui ont de l'expertise. On parle du H1B. Euh, les résultats sont à venir euh, pour voir si ça a été un succès, euh, mais ça a été, euh, c'est des gens qui sont, qui sont très intelligents, qui vont qui font vraiment améliorer, euh, qui vont am vraiment améliorer le Canada dans leurs compétences qu'ils apportent au Canada, qui ne sont pas nécessairement ici, alors c'est quelque chose qu'on doit regarder de près. Vous avez dit, vous avez dit ce matin euh, qu'il faut améliorer quand même l'expérience euh, des nouveaux arrivants, des immigrants. Euh, quel mesures phares pour vous pourraient répondre le, de façon la plus adéquate possible pour justement améliorer leurs conditions et améliorer à leur expérience ici comme nouveaux arrivants? Dans, dans notre champ de compétences, je dirais, je dirais les, euh, les délais de traitement. Ça a, vraiment, ça a été exécrable. Il y, a des raisons, il y a des raisons pour ça. Modernisation du système, la COVID notamment, l'incapacité de faire des choses à la main, les gens qui travaillaient chez eux, c'est clair qu'ils ne peuvent pas venir au travail, puis les, les, les dossiers s'empilaient. Euh, C'était toute une saga qu'on a vécue il y a un an, quand j'ai été président du, service, du comité du cabinet des services. Alors, je n'étais pas ministre de l'immigration dans ce temps-là, mais je savais ce à quoi, de, de, de quoi ça avait l'air. Euh, c'est clair qu'on peut faire mieux, puis je pense que le rapport de la vérificatrice générale en témoigne le progrès. Euh, mais ma conclusion, c'est de mieux faire notre job au fédéral. L'autre élément, c'est de mieux coordonner avec les provinces. C'est clair qu'il y a des éléments qu'on ne peut pas remplir à nous seuls. Crise du logement, euh, les besoins en santé, d'arrimer vraiment l'offre et la demande. Ça, c'est un travail de plus longue haleine. Euh, mais c'est des choses qui font euh, qui vont de pair. Oui, bonjour, Sandrine Biera du Devoir. Euh, Monsieur Miller, pouvez-vous nous confirmer si le Québec va embarquer dans l'initiative de l'accueil des 15 000 migrants de la Colombie, Haïti et du Venezuela? Euh, pour l'instant, la réponse, c'est non. Euh, c'est une réponse qui me désole, euh, surtout étant donné que c'est avec un, un partenaire stratégique, stratégique c'est-à-dire les, les États-Unis, qui veulent en sorte une soupape de, de sûreté, de sécurité pour euh, des gens qui fuient l'Amérique, certains pays de, de l'Amérique du Sud. On ne fait pas face aux mêmes défis que les, les Américains à notre frontière sud que ce que les Américains font face euh, avec leur frontière au Mexique. Donc, euh, pour les Américains, ils nous demandent de faire notre travail. Puis c'est le Québec qui forme 25 de la population des 
n'est pas à la mesure de le faire, c'est malheureux. Euh, je pense que c'est une conversation qu'on pourrait continuer, surtout dans la mesure où on a un volet dédié de migration haïtienne, la forte prépondérance de la population haïtienne étant à Montréal, je pense, puis francophone de plus, impeccable, donc ça va de soi que ces gens-là devraient être accueillis par le Québec. Ça remplirait plusieurs objectifs, on pourrait trouver des enseignants, etc. Euh, donc pour moi, c'est logique. Mais côté, côté humanitaire, pour l'instant, je trouve ça un peu désolant. Sur une autre note, euh, comptez-vous imposer un quota d'étudiants étrangers, y compris pour le Québec? Pour l'instant, pour l'instant. Ben, écoutez, le Québec euh, m'a dit qu'il revendiquait la juridiction sur les, les étudiants internationaux. Du même coup de plume, rejetait la juridiction sur les demandeurs d'asile. La différence étant qu'un à 50 000 l'autre zéro, ça me frustre. Euh, mais c'est clair qu'il y a une juridiction partagée. Et donc, ils ont leur mot à dire. C'est pas moi nécessairement d'être euh, la police du sous-financement secondaire, post-secondaire, qui, euh, qui était la règle au pays depuis plusieurs années, partout au Canada. Euh, mon rôle, c'est d'enrayer la fraude. Un rôle très clairement de façon juridictionnelle qui relève ben, de, de tous les paliers, des deux paliers. Et de s'assurer que les menaces à l'intégrité du système euh, soient enrayées dans ma capacité, euh, somme toute limitée, de le faire. Mais je suis prêt à le faire. Puis je suis prêt à faire davantage si les provinces n'en font pas plus. Le Québec, par contre, a fait un travail euh, durant ces dernières années, de, durant les dernières années de, de, de un peu faire le ménage dans leur système d'institutions approuvées pour les visas. Donc, ils ont une longueur d'avance. Um, mais c'est clair, niveau quota spécifiquement, c est, c est, c est, je pense que pour moi, ce n'est pas la mesure à retenir pour l'instant. Je me réserve le droit, évidemment. Je pense que ce qu'on a annoncé vendredi, c'était quelque chose de, de rationnel, de sensé. Euh, mais si ça perdure pendant l'année à suivre, il va falloir prendre des mesures plus fortes. J'espère ne pas le faire de façon unilatérale. Next question. Okay, Kevin Gallagher, CTV National News. Thanks for taking our questions, Minister. I'm just going to follow up on one that was already asked in French around the um, rising number in immigrants who are onward migration, leaving Canada. What is your department looking at in terms of what are the causes of the difficulty in retaining newcomers to Canada, and what are the solutions that you're looking at? Yeah, it's without reading, having read the report, Kevin. And, and, and I will because it's important to kind of gauge where this is going, looking at whether this is a true trend, um, and then looking at what we can actually do to retain people. But a lot, I would say the vast majority of people that come to Canada have a choice. Um, and if that choice is more competitive elsewhere, I think there's a competitive advantage that we're losing. Uh, so that's something that I'm going to have to need, that we will need to focus on as a department and as a government. Uh, the H-1B scoop, I guess, that we did is something that was uh, got a lot of public fanfare, but the results are still uh, pending, but I think those are really talented people that could contribute to any country. Uh, the skills and labor streams that are in fact the envy of a lot of countries that other countries are starting to, to, to reproduce and properly matching supply and demand, by implication mean that you're getting a brighter, uh, more qualified type of person, and those people do have choices. So the reasons for which they would choose to leave, and again I'm speculating, um, it could be affordability, it could be uh, you know, non-recognition of diplomas, uh, a unitary state perhaps being more capable of imposing um, accreditation as opposed to Canada, where the Supreme Court's told me that I have no job in, 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 um, in, in, in eliminating accreditation standards. These are really things that are up to the provinces. Uh, there are plenty of reasons that I could speculate, but it's, it's, it's sand in the gears that would make someone frustrated with being here and then leaving. What I'm also seeing, and this is the countervailing position, is, uh, is, is um, historic volume in people that want to come to Canada. And attracting that right volume, I think, is the challenge of, uh, of our government. Uh, but with that volume comes the corresponding pressure sometimes for people to say, wait, this wasn't for me. Uh, but right now, I think the, the main trend, if there were to, if you were to tease something accurate out of this, is that we have an unprecedented demand to come to Canada. Don't fault people for that, but we just want to make sure that we're doing it in the, in the way Canadians expect us to do it. So I'll be looking at the report um, and seeing if there are trends that are concerning. You've been asked a few times about housing affordability. And obviously, you're well aware of the recent surveys that are you know, Canadians are saying that they have you know, concern about the level of immigration and the level of immigrants coming to Canada because of uh, lack of available housing, housing shortages, housing availability, and affordability in general. But 
to today, in any of your answers, I hear that you're saying, well, the housing issue was long before we started increasing our immigration levels. But still, there is this feeling that people are saying to survey uh, companies that they're concerned and they're, uh, this is a rise in people saying that they're uncomfortable with the levels of immigration. So tomorrow you're announcing a number. Um, you're on the record saying that it's not going to be lower, maybe higher around, around the same. You can correct me if I'm wrong. But what reassurance can you give to people who seem to be having an increased anxiety about this that you know, the number of immigrants is not the source of the problem they see when it comes to finding a home and affordability? You know, in, in politics, again, it's very hard, or, or even in personal relationships, it's very hard to argue with feelings. Um, I, know that, I know the feelings that, uh, that I felt when I first got into politics when uh, there were affordability challenges uh, around housing, but for a lower segment, you know, a population that was um, on the lower income side of the, of, uh, of the population, and, and, and the fight that we took as a federal government to be the first government in a generation to invest in housing. Uh, certainly not enough, as evidence is proof of today, uh, but the interest on debt when I was in, in 2015 was, uh, was pretty much zero and continued to be so. It isn't immigration or immigrants that raise the interest rates, uh, and this is something that has to do with poor planning over the last 30 to 40 years, some provinces having done better um, than others, but clearly a crunch that is being felt is a generalized fashion. So that person renewing their mortgage, they're feeling a crunch that perhaps has nothing to do with the house that the international student's looking for, or, uh, or someone that, or that has just gotten to this country. Uh, sometimes, even though it's the same concept, we may be mixing apples and oranges. Again, uh, I'm trying to rationalize a, a debate of feelings, and, and clearly it's something we need to be sensitive to. And clearly it's something we know that on, uh, on the immigration side, in terms of the labor and the labor gaps and the needs that we need to fulfill those labor gaps, uh, identifying and clearly identifying for Canadians where that gap is going to get filled in the context of an aging population. So uh, yes, it's a, a challenge sometimes publicly to convince people that immigration is the solution. Um, again, we never ask in, 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 a, in, in, our, um, in our polling whether people would want reduction of the gross domestic product were they to reduce immigration, which would be the net result of things. But again, doing it in a way that's uncoordinated leads into that certain that feeling of uncertainty and the feeling that Canadians are being hard done by. I wasn't trying to sound cavalier to say this is something that's been happening for 30 years because it is urgent and it's an urgent that we address it. I think you've seen my colleague Sean Fraser uh, out leveraging a lot of the announcements that we've had on on the housing accelerator and, and, and highlighting a lot of the bills that the federal government's been responsible for. Again, this is the net uh, conclusion that I've, of all my meetings with people over the last few months, particularly in this ministry, is to do this in a coordinated way and in a way where we're not um, looking like we're out of step with, with provinces that are putting effort into it.